Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Lopez, uh, lawyer for Baker Tilly, an international film and consulting company. Welcome to the Cycle for Entrepreneurs attend session program uh, that addresses all respect to entrepreneurship. I take this opportunity to extend a cordial greeting to all those uh, who are joining for the first time and especially to those who are seeing the, the all, uh, all parts of the world. As you know, the Cycle for Entrepreneurs is an initiative promoted by Alumni Association, a new project of the school that offers five large areas of services to students and alumni in training and knowledge, professional development, networking, benefits and discount. In this first session that we have called Passion as the Engine of Entrepreneurship, We'll focus on general aspects uh, about entrepreneurships, like a competence and motivation, the golden circle, why, how, what, external constraints, passion as, as the engine of entrepreneurship, the idea of the business and its importance. To talk about uh, this, uh, this topic, we have the presence of Alvaro Cuesta. Hello. Alvaro is the co-founder of Son Adventures, the first Spanish, Spanish startup producer. Producer is a company uh, dedicated to advise a company and launch new projects uh, of, of proven success in the, in the international field. And Alvaro is also a consultant and a speaker in different companies and institutions in topics of digital strategy and entrepreneurship. Also, he was president of the Young Entrepreneurs Association mm -hmm. of the Madrid and the Young Council CM. And before handing the, the floor to Alvaro, I invite you to participate in this session and ask your question through Twitter or using the hashtag uh, you can see in, the, in your screen. Uh, hashtag EA Conference. EAE Conference. Again, welcome. Uh, your turn. Okay, well, thank you very much. And hello, everyone uh, from all parts of the world and, and all the students that are currently. Uh, studying at EAE. Um, as uh, Daniel said, my name is Alvaro Cuesta and I will be uh, your teacher for this course on, on entrepreneurship and how to build startups. It's supposed to teach you how to build successful startups, but of course, if I had the, the actual recipe, the, the magic recipe to build successful startups, uh, I mean, uh, I would be uh, incredibly millionaire and it's not the case. Um, so we're going to focus on a different concept of success. Success is not just what we'll be talking about it uh, in, the, in the next uh, <coughs> sessions, but success uh, could be uh, conceived uh, by anyone in, in different ways. But uh, my own point of view of success is basically to you know, build a startup at least according to our right purpose, for the right purpose, using the right methodologies, with the right people, having fun, in the meantime, and having fun sometimes is not just being happy and, and, and all, uh, you know, and, and all funny uh, moments. Uh, quite the contrary, you know, we will discuss all the different personal and emotional aspects on entrepreneurship. Uh, but in, and the outcome uh, might be a very successful company in terms of uh, financial indicators. But uh, they, this will not be our main focus. Of course, it will be a natural consequence. But also, we have to take into account that one of the other natural consequences are uh, failure. And we should just uh, talk about it as much as about success. Uh, I mean, specifically considering that, especially considering that uh, there is a 90% chance of failing uh, for a startup within the first three years. Maybe it's not the best way to start a a conference to motivate you, uh, to tell you that you will have a 90% chance of failing. Uh, but I think it's quite a very realistic uh, point uh, to start. Uh, now, as uh, Daniel says, that by the way, I thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Uh, as Daniel says, uh, you can ask me questions anytime. I have my, my Twitter account here, and I will try to to be uh, reading. The, the questions you have me uh, you have for me and in case in any case we will be uh, leaving the next uh, I mean the last 15 minutes 15 20 minutes to answer any questions that you might have uh, so please uh, feel free 
to ask any any questions at all i mean just take this course not just this session but all the sessions that we're going to have together as basically a conference about everything you always wanted to know about entrepreneurship and you never dare to ask basically that's kind of the concept about it so once again that's that's my definition of success uh, according to the, the scope of this course and the whole itinerary of this course. Uh, and of course, um, when we said doing it for the right purpose, you know, with the right people, uh, having fun in the meantime, and, and if we can make it, uh, financially speaking, then, I mean, that's even better. Uh, in fact, this should be our, you know, one of our main goals, of course, but not just the main goal. Uh, but all, also, we will be uh, talking about all the different methodologies that will help us along the way to create a successful startup, uh, minimizing the risks of failure. So when I tell you about 90% of companies fail, it's true, but it's false at the same time. Because 90% of the companies fail in many cases because they don't apply the principles and the methodologies that we're going to see here. And that does not imply that we will have incredible success, but uh, at least we will be increasing significant, significantly the, the chances and the odds of uh, being successful. And of course, uh, as you can imagine, it's not the same falling from a fifth floor than falling from a first floor. I mean, it's not the same pain, right? Well, this is what we're going to try as well. Uh, if we fail, we will fail uh, with the lowest uh, damages possible so we can keep uh, get back on track keep continue uh, keep going on our path to entrepreneurship because this is a, a, a long-term uh, run and eventually we will find that financial success especially uh, statistically speaking we need to consider that it takes 3.8 uh, failures uh, to, to, to you know to uh, to have uh, to make a, a major success in fact, if you know this uh, beverage called Seven Up, uh, the name comes from the seventh try of the entrepreneur to, to be successful, and it's like, okay, this is the, the, the seventh floor, uh, the seventh uh, time I have to make it, so um, I might just call it Seven Up and, and see how and see what it takes me. And so, of course, this is an extreme uh, in, uh, scenario, but uh, once again, I just want to, you know put the right expectations, not just on the sessions and the whole uh, itinerary, but also on entrepreneurship in itself. Uh, because it's been, it's been said a lot about entrepreneurship, um, quite a lot. In fact, it's somehow in fashion. It's like the cool thing to do for many people. All the media are talking about startup people and entrepreneurs and how cool it is. And well, I mean, somehow it could be, but I just want to give you a realistic, uh, a brutally honest overview of entrepreneurship in case uh, you're thinking about becoming one uh, or you already started. Uh, well, that's, that's basically my point. So today is an introductory course. That's why I'm, I'm taking so long on explaining the expectations and the whole scope. We will be, uh, today, I'm, of course, I'm going to introduce myself as well so you have a glance of who I am, where I come from, also to understand why I say what I say and whatever legitimacy you want to give me, well, it will be based on my experience and my background. And of course, this is not dogmatic. This is just my own personal point of view. I'm not a, I'm not a teacher uh, uh, for a job. I'm an entrepreneur and I take, I don't know, I give 5% of my time to teaching and I do it for pure motivation and conviction, uh, basically to, just to help you uh, develop a real sense of entrepreneurship. Um, so I will give you my personal background. Also, we will cover you know the main contents, and we will start since we have a, like an hour and fifteen minutes, an hour more or less. Uh, we will start by uh, talking about the uh, personal and emotional aspects of, of entrepreneurship, and uh, also some elements about the uh, ecosystem, uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So, having said that. Um, who am I? Um, well, as I said, my name is Alvaro. Uh, my Twitter account is Emprender Cuesta. 
means uh, being an entrepreneur is hard. That's the literal translation in case you are like only uh, speaking uh, people. Uh, emprender cuesta. And that's my Twitter name uh, in case you want to ask me any questions during this conference or at any time. I will be more than uh, happy to help you out. And uh, well, I've, I'm 36 years old, almost 37, and I've been an entrepreneur, well, basically around more than 15 years. I, I started when I was 19, I would say, and uh, well, I've created more than 12 companies. Most of them, if not all of them, are related to uh, technology and internet, but on different fields. I, I built uh, actually a, a law firm. Uh, I'm a lawyer, though I might not look like one, but I used to be a lawyer, my suit, my tie and, and everything. And, uh, and I, it, was a, it was not just a typical legal firm. It was, a, it was an internet law firm. So I dealt with all the issues and aspects of uh, startups, technology and law. Uh, also, I developed a web development company. I, I built a web development company, especially focused on web accessibility uh, to build IT projects that at least would be uh, adapted uh, to handicapped people or people with disabilities. Uh, so that we could bring technology also to them and, and help uh, reduce the bridge or the gap uh, for them uh, in terms of IT accessibility. Then I also built, uh, just to, to mention some of my main uh, projects, an, um, an online marketing company uh, focused on digital communication and online reputation management. And uh, three companies uh, were part of one group. I had more than 30 employees. And well, uh, some of my companies have gone very well and most of them have gone badly. And this is just part of the statistics. And that's why I think it's a good opportunity for you to ask me about any of my failures. I mean, really, I'm, I'm brutally honest about any data, information, emotional or personal aspect you want to ask me and you know it, it, this is not just uh, something that I tell my students in the classroom because this video it will be uploaded and available and accessible uh, to everyone on YouTube but uh, I believe that the more transparent we are as entrepreneurs the more we will help the ecosystem to, to develop in, in, instead of creating a fake idea of entrepreneurship. Uh, and that also means showing vulnerability and, and transparency. So feel free, honestly, to, to ask me anything. So as I, as I was telling you, I built some companies on the IT field. I sold some of them. I went on bankruptcy to one of some of them. Uh, and uh, at some point, I became the president of the National Entrepreneur Association and vice president at a European level. That was because I had a purpose to help and foster entrepreneurship. And that helped me also to understand and see and talk and help uh, many companies, young companies, young startups, young entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm just telling you all that, not just to be self-centric and tell you about myself, uh, you know, from an ego point of view, but uh, just to give you a glance of who I am and, and, and the bias of my comments, okay? Uh, once I stopped being a politician for two and a half years, um, and not being an entrepreneur, after selling to my two of my companies, I decided to start my ne my next uh, project, and that was called uh, Sonar Ventures. It's actually my actual goal, uh, my my actual project. Sorry, and uh, it's basically. Well, at the time, I didn't know what it was. I just did it. Uh, but now it's what they call a venture builder, or startup studio, or. Uh, or a startup producer uh, company, producing company. Basically what we do is instead of being consultants and helping people uh, with their own projects and getting paid for it, we build our own companies. I love entrepreneurship, I love building companies, I love building ideas and it was not enough for me to build just one and, and say no to I mean, so many other possibilities. So I thought it was the best framework to do it. And also once again, that helped me to talk to so many people that wanted to become entrepreneurs because the way we did it was we uh, basically we got money we actually do get money from investors we have more than 15 20 investors so we created a, an investment vehicle 
And with that money, we invest around 200K on each company and we find a person to lead and to run that company. Imagine this is a, a movie studio and the, and the actual producer uh, finds a director to run the movie. Sometimes the director could be the producer, sometimes they find an, an external director, sometimes the idea comes from the director, some others comes from the producer, some others from external sources. Well, it's exactly the same thing with startups. Sometimes uh, I get ideas from the outside and uh, sometimes I build my own ideas. And now, especially uh, last year, we're focusing on going for the next step, uh, to the next step, which means um, building startups, co-producing the companies with big corporations. They, they need to innovate, they need disruptive innovation, and they, uh, they cannot do it. They are way too big and too slow and, and, and zero agile. So what we do is we take the risk with them and we say, okay, just let's build a startup together. We do it, we take care of it, we take the risk with you, we find the team, we build it, we help them, and it will be built outside of the corporation. So that's what actually what we do. And one of the, the projects it's, it's called uh, Food in the Box, and we will be discussing about it uh, quite a lot because this project is one of the loves of my life at this point, <laughs> apart from my daughter. Um, the reason why I mentioned that is that what happened was I, I built this project, it was a startup called Food in the Box, and somehow I felt that the impact and the purpose was so big, what actually what Elon Musk uh, calls uh, the massive transformational purpose was so huge that I took a step down uh, from Sonar Ventures and I became uh, the director of my own movie. Uh, so basically I'm uh, now the CEO of Food in the Box and chairman of Sonar Ventures. Now, sorry for, be, for taking so long, but I just wanted to make sure that in five minutes you would get my whole uh, background and understand that you can ask me anything about the legal aspects, the IT aspects, the online marketing aspects and the emotional aspects of what it takes to be an entrepreneur and uh, you know the, the pros and cons of, of that. Uh, so that's me. Uh, it's a shame we don't have the time to introduce ourselves, whoever you are on the other side of the screen, but uh, I hope I get to know you as, uh, as long as we, uh, I mean as we uh, we keep um, with this course and you can send me emails at the same time. My email is alvaro at sonarventures.com. You can send me emails and I will try to answer you as, much, as, uh, as fast as possible. So that's about me, but um, enough about me. Let's talk about the course. Uh, okay, keys to create a successful startup. Where are the, the, the building blocks that we're going to cover? Well, today we're going to talk about, and, and well, today and, and actually for the most part of the course, uh, we are going to cover these uh, six main aspects. Mm, the first ones are going to be focused on personal and social requisites. You have to take into account that most uh, entrepreneurship courses, they start from the idea. I mean, they, they say, okay, this is the idea, so now let's help to develop it. I don't believe in that because I think the idea, honestly, is uh, completely worthless. Uh, and uh, why do I think it's worthless? Well, first of all, I haven't met any founder that currently runs a successful company that it's completely similar to the initial idea that he had or she had. Um, and that means that um, if you're flexible enough, and you should be in order to become a successful entrepreneur, uh, you have to be agile, we'll, we will see the methodologies. And the, the main, one of the main risks at the beginning is to focus too much on that idea. Uh, we will see uh, in these and, and other classes how important it is to forget about it and focus on the real problem that you're trying to solve and the right customer for whom you're trying to solve the problem. Um, and behind all that, and we will see that today as well, you need to ask yourself, what is the main 
purpose about it. And that leads us uh, to uh, discuss about the importance of the golden circle and, uh, and how important it is to start from the why, from the purpose. We will, we will see that. So anyway, we will cover, uh, once again, the personal and emotional aspects, the social aspects of entrepreneurship. That means to find the right elements of the ecosystem and to start our own company and our own idea in the right ecosystem. Mm. And also the, uh, the golden circle. And then, once we have that, we will uh, focus on the team, how important it is the team. We will talk about it today. Once we know what are the elements uh, for us to take into account to see if we are good or bad entrepreneurs and what are the traits and the skill set that we should look for in, uh, in our founders, in our founding team, in, our, in our, the rest of the team, then we will start talking about methodology. It's not only about people and emotions, uh, although it's one of the main, main points. In fact, uh, I had somehow like an aha moment or a breakthrough in my, in my uh, career when I uh, realized what, one of these quotes of uh, Siglar, it's his name, he said, we don't build business, we build people and then people build the business. Well, actually, that's what you need to keep in mind. Uh, you will not be building a business, you will not be building a successful startup. You will be building a team that will build the project. And the moment you have that clear and it's a central part of your mindset, uh, and you have in your mindset two main things, your team and your customer, then whatever I say is worthless, if you really apply that, okay? Uh, because that will do the rest eventually, you will be successful. So we will talk about that, but then we will get into methodologies because uh, we will try to reduce the risk of failing and there are certain methodologies that we will discuss uh, that will help us, I mean, first of all, to start our project with the lowest resources possible, even with $50, if you may. Uh, and I promise you, we can build a company with less than 100 euros. Believe it or not, you might think I'm exaggerating, you will see. Uh, so we will see that methodologies uh, we will talk about Lean Startup, you probably heard of it, if not, don't worry, we will talk so much about it. In the meantime, I recommend you to, to read the book called The Lean Startup from Eric Ries, we will see it after. Then we will get into a similar and complementary methodology called uh, Customer Discovery and Customer Development by a guy named Steve Blank. Um, those two methodologies will help us to, to, to basically to run companies uh, fast, low resources, lower risks, uh, more agility, uh, more information about what we're doing, so more clarity, more certainty on, on this complicated and this complex environment of becoming an entrepreneur and having the customer as the main uh, role and the, in, in, the, in the epicenter of of our project. So once we learn about that and we learn how to build a product, we, we will call that an MVP, a minimum viable product. Okay, it's not a most valuable player, as some of my students have told me once. Uh, no, it's a minimum viable product. We will see how important it is to, to take that into, into account and to start from there uh, in terms of product building. We will see how we can build a product with no resources, just a lot of creativity, audacity, and, and, and then uh, applying the, the mechanisms and the methodologies that we will see, that will get us going and, and get the ball rolling to, to start doing iterations. We will see that in the next classes as well. The iterations are, it could be pure iterations, slight changes in your uh, business according to the information that you're getting from the market and the customer um, or pivoting uh, which main means uh, major shifts uh, in terms of uh, your business model so don't worry I'm, I'm talking about too many concepts but 
we will see that uh, in the next uh, sessions. So uh, we will talk about MVP, we will talk about iteration, we will talk about pivoting, we will talk about building, measuring and learning. They're the main aspects of uh, the Lean Startup methodology. It's a continuous loop of making a hypothesis, uh, making an experiment, uh, creating an experiment to develop that hypothesis, taking the results, analyzing those results, making changes in the main hypothesis, and learning from uh, you know the, those results, and then make another experiment. And as abstract and, and as weird or way too scientific uh, it might sound, it's something that, believe me, 95% of, of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley or more developed ecosystems are doing every day. And they do that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a, on a, on a bi-weekly basis, and on a monthly basis. They do constant experiments and iterations. So we will talk about that. We will talk about how to understand the customer, how to build the, the, the customer personas. And uh, once we do that, and we will try to find what we call the traction, uh, which means that, okay, we, we, we found the problem according to our purpose. We, found, we, 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 we learned how to solve the problem for the right customer because we know the customer very well. We built a product to, to, you know, to develop a solution for that customer and that problem. And that product starts being uh, improved with the feedback, continuous feedback from the market. And we start growing as well in terms of users and why not uh, cash or money and customers. So we will uh, start growing until we find what we call, well, what Lean Startup methodology calls, uh, well, actually in customer development calls, the product market fit. The product market fit, we will dedicate a whole session on it, but it's basically like a, like a, a marriage between the product, your product, and your customer base, your market. And when you find the right product for the right audience and they blend together and they fall in love, well, that's when you uh, really are growing a business and we will see how important it is in order to find that market fit, that product market fit to, to apply these methodologies and, and also how to, how to grow in terms of users and customers. So as you can see in the, in the sixth point there, uh, you can see there are metrics for pirates. That will be another part of the, of the program that we will discuss in depth uh, and that means uh, it's, a, it's a methodological framework called Metrics for Pirates uh, from a guy named uh, Dave McClure that well, he's a genius in terms of startups and he's built or helped to build more than 700 startups and he developed this framework. The name comes from the uh, acronym for, uh, you know, the R. Uh, the, the R is the scream, you know, from pirates when they go to, to take on a boat. Uh, it's, an, it's a mnemotechnic uh, to, to, to state the acquisition, activation, uh, retention, revenue, referral. So A-A-R-R-R-R. That's metrics for pirates. And we will see that because we, it will help us to understand how you can find users that come to our website or to our app or our product, whatever, our store, whatever. Those users turn into active users. Uh, and that are more interested on, on our product, on our service, on the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, those active users, we will have retention with them. So they normally don't buy the first time they get uh, to, to our website or to, let's say, to our product. But we keep in touch with them. We, we, we become part of their top of mind. We, we engage with them to a certain number of times until they become customers. Uh, thanks to our revenue uh, options, uh, our revenue actions, uh, sorry. We will see different ways to, to turn those retained users into final customers that pay or use our service and subscribe and, and do everything. And once we do that, we will see how to make those customers recurrent, 
because that's the real important thing to have a customer that is recurrent. We will see why also when we discuss about the KPIs, the, the key performance indicators, how important it is to measure everything we do. Uh, and, and so we will, we will talk about recurrency and at the same time we will talk about referral. How, to, how, how can we use our client base to get our, and increase our client base? Basically, doing different experiments to increase our funnel, our acquisition funnel, uh, thanks to our own satisfied customers. So all those uh, methodologies are great, uh, but uh, what about the money? Uh, you know, uh, this is something you cannot see on the screen, but because it's not part of the session today as well, but uh, we will be discussing in our last session on how important it is to have the right amount of money uh, at, a, at, a, at the right stage of our company and what are the different types of investors and sources of financing uh, and what should we give in return. Because I'm sure that you say, okay, yeah, I know that I can find investors, but how do I know how much my company is worth? Uh, I mean, what is the percentage of my company that I should uh, give away in exchange for money? When is the right time? How do I do it? Uh, should I make a business plan? Should I not? Well, to start, I, I must tell you that I'm against business plans by default. And I'm sorry to tell you that. I know you, most of you have already done a business plan and as a final work in your masters and whatever you have studied here. But um, I mean, the truth from my point of view is that I haven't met any entrepreneur that enters the office on a Wednesday morning and searches for the, you know, what is the business plan saying about the forecast. The reality is that we will be talking about the concept of what a startup is and how uncertainty is so much part of it. And it's impossible. I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was possible. But now it's impossible to predict what is going to happen within the next year. So doing a forecast for the next three to five years, I mean, sometimes you need to do it because some investors ask you for it. But with when you when you're already you know uh, doing the business and and you're already having a product and, and, and clients and users and everything, but I will not I will not start the company with a business plan. That will restrain your your agility so much because you're basically saying I know what I'm going to do, regardless of the information of what the market and the customers are telling me and regardless of any changes that external changes that will have an impact on my own strategy and my product and the reason that startups are created and they're named startups and not SMEs uh, small and medium enterprises is because they are small they uh, they start and go up in a very short period of time and they have they're in search of a business model. That's one of the main also definitions of a startup. They're in continuous search of a, of a business model. So you cannot define by intelligent design what your business model will be. If you want to start a bakery, then it's fine. You know your business model. You know it's good you make a business plan because you, you have your initial investment and you're going to sell bread. You know the prices because it's in the market. You might you know, lower a little bit or make it higher. You can make three scenarios and, and basically somehow, it's somehow easy to, to make that plan. Now, uh, if you create a startup, uncertainty is so much, so high in your business model, you don't even know if your clients are going to be from, uh, business, from, from businesses, corporations, your final clients are going to pay. Uh, you know, just to give you an example, Facebook uh, is making money, but it's not making money from you. It's making money from the advertisers. Uh, uh, I have companies where I've changed the customer that pays me five times in one year. And what would happen if I just stick, have, uh, uh, you know, stick to, to the initial plan? Well, I, I wouldn't be uh, alive uh, in that project. So 
once again, uh, forget about business plans at the beginning. Uh, you have to do them when it's completely necessary, and that's and to me that's when you go for fundraising. And even so, it's better to instead of doing a business plan. I, I I've raised I don't know a couple million euros in my uh, experience from different types of investors, and I never had to give a business plan. I I've developed a, an investor's deck, which is and we will see in the next sessions. Uh, it's somehow like a presentation with uh, 20, 30 slides that are basically more visual than content that will cover the main aspects of your business and will try to sell the and explain and, and clarify everything about your business uh, to a potential investor. But that's all, honestly. Plus uh, an Excel, of course, with the financial projections that the, the investor knows that they're never going to be fulfilled because they know they're professionals. They, they see that every day. They know that it never happens, but at least they, they know that you've done your homework and that you understand the variables that condition your business model, regardless of you know your predictions. At least you understand how much things cost, uh, things cost how much uh, you should charge for those things. You know, it just helps you clarify your own business model, but that's it. Don't, don't, don't overestimate uh, business model. So that's the whole uh, program. And today, uh, we've seen uh, who am I, who are you? Well, I'm sure you're uh, all types of uh, people. Uh, we will talk about the social prerequisites, uh, first thing. Okay, um, imagine our business model or our business project is a is a it's a seed it's a plant it's a, it's a potential plant wouldn't it make a difference uh the ecosystem where you would plant that seed i mean is it the same when you plant uh soy in a in a desert or in the jungle or in a in a in the rainforest or i mean whatever of course not right well with companies is exactly the same and it's not just about your potential market i mean that's obvious and you had to do it on every single business plan that you've made on your life but i'm not just talking about your potential customers i'm talking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem and that's something that i just want to talk about it uh for the next um uh, three to five minutes um just for you to to take it in mind that to keep in mind that you should not start a company in your comfort zone. I mean, just because you're from Spain, you don't have to start the company in Spain unless you have no other option. Just because you're from Ecuador, you, need, you know, it means you need to start a company in Ecuador. Just try to find the right ecosystem. Consider all the elements, at least consider them before starting the project. Because even if you have no more choice because your family lives there, because I mean, whatever. Even so, at least it's a very good exercise to understand each and every aspect of the uh, ecosystem. Uh, you know, as you can see in the in the um, screen, there is uh, one college called uh, Babson that uh, developed the the Bab the, the, the Babson uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And they stated all the different elements. And as you can see there, you can see policy, education, culture, finance, support. I mean, all of those elements. And maybe you will start the company in your own country, but at least you should be aware how the financial ecosystem is. Because if you want to start a social network that imagine, uh, that you know uh, can only work if investors uh, uh, you know support you with millions of euros and you're in, a, in, in an ecosystem where that is almost impossible to do um, and looking in other countries at the beginning is very difficult unless you actually go there and start you know you, you just don't go to Silicon Valley and look for investors if you are planning to work from Spain because I mean I've seen some exceptions uh, to that but for the most part, investors, they want to invest in companies that are close from their house, uh, their homes or their offices. So to, 
to, to sum it up, you uh, you have to take into account that in case uh, as, as one of the risks and all the benefits that you can take from the ecosystem you're living in. And consider as well the talent you can acquire for your business, the, the consultants and professionals that you can find in that, how, you know, the, the cultural framework of uh, of the country you're living in, take all those elements into account as just one thing more to consider when you start a business. Okay, it's just something that it's good to know, uh, and most people don't don't take into account. So that's that's one thing. That's like the social requisites. Uh, there there are other uh, requisites that are personal requisites. What's that mean? Well, not everybody can be an entrepreneur, okay? Uh, sometimes we feel pressurized. We feel pressured because we somehow, we see in Facebook, you know, like the cool thing to do is to become an entrepreneur and, and then working for someone else is boring and whatever. And everybody, you know, is building startups and things like that. And let me tell you, uh, once again, not everyone is made for entrepreneurship. In fact, very few people. Uh, it's like uh, it's like telling, you know, uh, are you made to become a marathon runner? Well, potentially speaking, anyone. I mean, most people could be uh, potential marathon runners. I could not be, honestly. I don't have the the willingness <clears throat> and the persistence to to. To do that I'm not feeling motivated and I might feel motivated for the idea of becoming a runner but I know that if I ever take the chance of becoming one uh, I might not be in my zone you know I might not be at the, at the uh, you know at my full potential of what I can do of course anybody can do whatever they want I mean they can it's just a matter of you know uh, willingness and I mean will but, uh, you know, I've seen many people becoming entrepreneurs without the skill set uh, that is necessary to become an entrepreneur. So we're going to discuss for the next five minutes uh, the main skills that you need to take, in, take into account. If we were in class right now, physically speaking, uh, we would probably make, a, you know, a collective uh, exercise of you know, discussing the elements of uh, entrepreneurship and what it takes to become a good or a bad entrepreneur. In this case, I'm just going to give you the, the, the conclusions of, you know, dozens of workshops and classes about it. And of course, there are many skills that are nice to have. But if I had to tell you the main aspects uh, that I take into account if I want to invest in an entrepreneur or I want to co-found a company with an entrepreneur or I want to mentor an entrepreneur I take first of all of course ethics you might say yeah you can give, be a good entrepreneur without ethics well you might you know there are cases but for the most part uh, when you start with low resources unless you're like a rich person and have plenty of money but when you're with low resources and as I was telling you before, it's all about the people. As, it, it, as cliche as it might sound, believe me, it's true. Um, so basically, it's difficult to get surrounded by good people if you're not good people. <laughs> so my point is, if you're a reliable person, a trustworthy person, you will attract investors, partners, co-founders, employees and clients and many others many other stakeholders so ethics something to me ethics and work ethics is something that I would consider key uh, of course it's difficult to say oh yeah but I don't have ethics so I'm not a good entrepreneur so just you will see that on the way and of course you would all probably will think that you have ethics and it, it will be true for the most part I'm sure 
But the other aspects are two main aspects that don't consider creativity, for example, as one of the main issues. If you think, well, I want to become an entrepreneur, but I don't have any specific idea. Well, don't worry about the idea. You don't have to be creative. You don't even have to have an idea to become an entrepreneur. Um, that sounds weird as well, but let me tell you, I've seen entrepreneurs without specific ideas, either because they associated with the right co-founder that had the idea and the vision and he shared or she shared the vision and joined, uh, joined the project or because with the right purpose he or she found a problem that wanted to solve and you know finding the right problem leads to a business opportunity and this is a very important message a key idea of, of this workshop. Uh, if you have an idea and you want to start your company from the idea, from the solution, whatever you do on the way, uh, if the idea turns out not to be the right one, then your business is over. I mean, what's the point? Um, but if you find the right problem, you will find a solution, a potential solution, but let me tell you, there's a 90% chance that that solution will not be the right one at the, at the beginning. So then you will try another one and then another one and make slight changes or major changes to the solution to the problem. And once you have that solution, then you will try to find the right customer. Uh, of course, you do that on the way, but you know, it's not, I mean, the specific type of customer. We'll, we'll talk about that. So my point is, you don't have to be creative. You don't have to have a, the idea to become an entrepreneur. And what you need to have is something that we will discuss later. So the second thing that you might need to have is persistence. I see entrepreneurship as, um, uh, how would I say, you know, as if you were a surfer and you, uh, you loved surfing and you were, you know, with your board and you know, on the sea and it was, it gets cold. you start waiting for the big wave and it's not coming. It's not coming. It's not coming. You, your mind tells you all types of, you know, self excuses just to go back home and, and, and forget about it and try the next morning. But if you're really passionate about it and you're persistent, uh, eventually the wave might come, might. And then you need to be and have the skills and, you know, and to be prepared after you know training to take that wave and not just to take it but to stay on the wave so to me they're like the 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 to me that's all about entrepreneurship <laughs> as simplistic as it might sound it's about you know having the passion to go there out, out on the sea for no rational reason just take a piece of wood or you know or plastic or whatever material and um, on the cold and, and just take a risk, a necessary risk for the sake of it and, 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 and wait for hours for something to happen and just enjoy the few seconds to do it. That might not seem rational for most people and that's what makes the difference between entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs. And the people that are willing to do it and then enjoy just the idea of doing it and take the risk of doing it and have the persistence to, you know, to not listen to all those internal dialogues and have the skills to get on the on the board at the right time and the bravery to, to do that and you know you know they, they might start the business and it might start to go well but if they don't know how to get on the wave and, and ride the wave and, and you know uh, which means scaling your business making it grow and make it sustainable well, then, then it's just, uh, you know, it's a shame because it's, a, it's an over-motivated person with no skills or with skills to get on the table, but not on the, on the board, but not just to ride the whole wave in that, that it's not an entrepreneur. So it's all about the three points. It's about having the passion and the vision to go there and on the sea. It's about having the persistence to, to remain and wait for the right moment and, and, and be prepared for it and, and train yourself for it. And then when it's the right moment, and that could be called the product market fit, then you need to learn how to write it and scale your company and, and just ride that wave. So persistence is, if 
not the most, I mean, one of the most important traits of an entrepreneur. It might sound cliche, but honestly, is the difference. Another, another uh, main trait that I would say is what experts call resilience. Okay. Resilience is the is as opposed to persistence resilience is the ability to fall and get back on track is about as i put here you know this is a tattoo of a phoenix bird you know it's about falling and i mean dying and rising from the ashes right away you know it's about getting on a board and learning how to fall and not just fall and get back not fall and get back but also to have a major fall, like like a big, huge wave that you know breaks an arm or makes you have a concussion. And instead of going home and, and, and having fear to, to go back again and, and maybe wait a few months to start again, then just the ability to go back on track. That's called resilience. Is the property of the materials to you know to when they are stretched. I mean to go back uh, to the initial state. Okay. Um, so that is a very rare trait and is one of the main points, uh, the main differences between successful entrepreneurs and non-successful entrepreneurs. Because as I said before, failure is part of the path. Uh, you have to embrace failure, not look for it consciously, but you have to embrace it as part of the deal. As when you're running, you will be having cramps and you will be wanted to quit and you'll have pains and, and that's that's part of the deal. So once again, uh, only the few people that have, you know, eventually, you know, you will be persistent and you have to be self-motivated continuously. But apart from that, to be persistent, uh, you need to be prepared for major setbacks. You know, you need to be prepared for m minor setbacks. That would be persistence and major setbacks, which means having a bankruptcy, losing your main co-founders, having your whole team abandoning you, having a divorce at the same time you're becoming an entrepreneur, having a personal loss and start uh, and still becoming an entrepreneur, uh, you know, having a problem with the IRS or your fiscal problems or legal problems, any types of major setbacks, losing your main client, uh, you know, things that are, you know require you not just to be persistent which means like having you know like a long distance runner but at the same time being a long distance runner and have a major fall break a leg and keep running okay so and maybe break a leg and keep running is not the best uh, example because uh, we will discuss at the same time in other uh, sessions if you want about failure because some of you uh, normally ask me about when is the right time to quit? Because what is the difference between being persistent and being stupid? Okay? It's a very difficult question. I have the answer, uh, my own personal answer. And of course, it has to do with ethics, you know? Not putting, I mean, putting yourself at any risk, okay, but putting others at that risk, it's not right. So at least that needs to be consensual with your family, with your environment, with your friends. I mean, especially with your team, okay? And also when the indicators are telling you, I mean, this is not working, and we will discuss about the importance of, uh, of, of measuring things, that is something to really take into account, but not necessarily to follow it like a, like a dogma, because I've seen businesses that, you know, uh, Indicators were not saying to continue, I mean, rationally speaking, and still they kept going and finally they made it. Take Airbnb, they were like almost three years uh, without making like reservations, like apart from like three, four per day. And eventually they started booming, you know. Indicators, if they had decided to use that only information, of course, you know, it would not make sense. If they had to consider the financial information of what the cash, how much money was left, that's probably 
the mainstream people will tell you uh, you should close the business when you have enough money to close it. Well, I've done it and I've done the contrary. And there's sometimes it's better to do it if you see it clear, but if you feel passionate about it and there are indicators that tell you something but not very clear and your team wants to follow you on with a, with a clear framework of what can happen, I would keep going. I would be persevering because it's what the experts call the valley of death. And uh, every major successful business has ever been through the valley of death. And only the ones that have crossed that path have become successful. And to cross that sometimes implies going against the mainstream advices that you might get out there, the politically correct advices. Like uh, have enough cash to close the company, uh, you know, just uh, act rationally on the information. Well, yeah, yes, but no. I hope you get. I hope you get me clear. Um, so, anyway, um, so persistence and resilience are the two main uh, traits. But this is connecting uh, with. The, one of the most important aspects of the of the of the session today. Uh, how do I know if I am a resilient person, and how do I know that I'm a persistent person? Because, for example, I'm not persistent as a runner. I'm not persistent when I have to go to the gym. I'm not persistent when I have to study every day. I'm not. I'm just not the kind of person. But I can tell you, like, I'm incredibly persistent. Probably the one of the top five persistent people that you will meet in your life uh, in terms of being an entrepreneur. So why and how do I know it? Well, there's no such thing as being persistent or not. I think that, of course, that is a, that's something to consider, but I think it's all about the gas that is behind that persistent persistence. It's about the motivation. If you have the right motivation, you become persistent. If you don't have the right motivation, you're just not persistent. That's that. It's that simple. So, uh, how do I call? What do I call that motivation? Well, to me, it's purpose and passion. Without passion, there's no successful entrepreneurship. Because let me tell you, things will get rough, and eventually it will be one time at some point maybe in the beginning maybe at the end where you will wake up in the morning and you have no cash in the bank account you're not getting paid because you need you to pay your employees first uh, your personal life is actually crumbling because you're too focused on you know extinguishing the fires that you have on a daily basis in your own company your team is starting to abandon to abandon the ship because the external signs of uh, the, of the of the business are you know that we're not any there. Uh, you know, as part of the crew was telling Christopher Columbus when he was about to you know get a get you know uh, to go back or to to resign uh, and to be defeated as you know uh, on his trip to the you know the the Americas or whatever he thought he was looking for uh, so it will be a point where you will not be motivated by money because that would be so far away that it's not even worth to think about it there will be uh, you know too many risks and too many things that will put your motivation down so the only thing you will have in mind to keep you going, it will be purpose. It will be your own passion. It will be your internal gas, your internal gasoline, your internal propulsion that will make you persistent and eventually, you know, uh, go through that valley of death and, and, and become successful entrepreneur. Uh, so that leads me to the importance of finding the, the golden circle. Uh, you can have the slide there about the the golden circle, but I'm not. I cannot see it because I, I don't see it on my screen. Uh, in, on my screen, so let's let's see if uh, someone can can see it. Uh, or let me just check. Sorry. 
because I I don't have sorry I don't have the sign off. No, I lost the, the sign off. Anyway, so uh, we will we will see that how important it is the the golden circle uh, because it, it's a whole paradigm on how we build companies. Most people. I would say 90% of the people uh, start the companies from the what? I mean, the solution, the idea. Uh, and that normally takes us, uh, you know, to where we talked before. Uh, to, to, you know, having an idea that is, if it's not working, it can just be blown by the wind and and the company is over, and that's part of this 90% failure rate, you know? Uh, so the important thing is to start a company from the why, not from the what. The why, the purpose. Why do you want to become an entrepreneur? Why do you want to solve that problem? What, what is the actual gas? What is the actual motivation? What is making you passionate about doing what you're going to do? And is, it might seem as a motivational speech type of um, theory or, or uh, argument, but let me tell you, it's 100% true. This is not a, mot a motivational speech. This is a class about entrepreneurship from real life experience. And I've gone through that, as I was telling you. I've gone through very rough times where the only thing that kept me going was the, I mean, the dream of doing something meaningful uh, for, uh, and thinking about the impact that my project might have and the impact that it would have on myself as well and how, how much of a growing experience it was meaning for me. And I knew that it was, you know, uh, it was the internal combustion engine that I needed to keep going. And eventually, you know, I became successful in those businesses. So, I know that for a fact and whenever I was not having that I was uh, you know I was just uh, quitting and uh, you know uh, nothing happened I was not ha you know if if you don't have fun even in in, in those situations and by having fun once again it's not a naive or childish approach I'm ha having fun means you know to have this adrenaline of uh, getting to the office and, 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 and you know and knowing that you have a challenge it's like playing a video game that is very difficult but you know still there's a challenge and you're frustrated but you still want to keep going well that passion is what you need to think about when you really want to decide whether to become entrepreneurs or not okay so starting the company from the why is a key point because that will lead you to have the right purpose then you will find the right problem that you want to solve uh, or you first found the problem but with i mean connected to a purpose then you will attract the right people and then that people and you will start building the business and then once you start building the business you will start you know applying these methodologies and get back on track and, and, and get going so that's why it's so important to to do that uh, well, you can see that uh, uh, that we're talking about people, and it, we should not consider just ourselves uh, as entrepreneurs if we are persistent or resilient or passionate. We need to consider the team. So, how do we find the right team? How do we find the right partners? Well, in order to do that, we need to be very transparent and very honest with ourselves and be aware of basically our weaknesses and strengths i think it's one of the few times where i really believe you should do a swot analysis or a tafo you know like a, like make a, a self analysis and, and be aware of the archetype of person that you are because most of the people that i've met in my life uh entrepreneurial life they tend to to get uh, surrounded by people that are similar to them. And it's funny because even most of the time they find people that are similar to them and worse, which means more mediocre. And that's the word, I mean, it's, to me, it's like one of the 
most common factors of failure. Finding people that are not complementary to you and they're not better than you. Uh, because if, once again, if we believe that it's about the people that build the business and the people are not brilliant, well, then there's no business. So how do we find that? Well, first, there are two or three archetypes of people that might help us to find at least, of course, you know, we're very complex as human beings, but there are certain archetypes that will find, uh, that will help us find the right answer. One of them is the definition between, the distinct the extension between hacker and hustler. What is a hacker? Uh, of course, there is not, you know, hacker is not just the person that is behind the computer trying to you know, sneak into the Pentagon's uh, uh, database or whatever. No, is is about being a person that is very organized, very structured, very realistic, sometimes even pessimistic, very down to earth, hard worker, self organized, basically. And that could be the 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 COO, the 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 chief operations officer. Or it could be the CTO, the developer. Uh, that happens for the most part. Some other times I've seen it even in the business developer uh, role. Um, but um, you should ask yourselves if you're a hacker. Because if you're so, you should find the other side of the coin, which is the hustler. The hustler is a person that is very, I mean, normally, of course, uh, this is, uh, these are archetypes. Uh, Hassler is a person that is a good salesperson, uh, uh, good communication skills, is very, sometimes dispersed, like an energetic, but over-optimistic, enthusiastic, which is very good to get clients, to get people, to communicate to the media, to get investors, but sometimes, the hustler sees uh, the hackers as boring and, and, and pessimistic and wants to be surrounded by optimistic people like him or her. And that leads to massive failure. Uh, and also, you know, the, there comes the ego and the competition be between equals and, 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 and the power uh, gains. And that's the beginning of the end. And normally, once again, and the main, main problems that I've seen associated with failure in startups are due to emotional origins, no emotional aspects, either within the entrepreneur or within the relationship of the entrepreneur with the co-founders or the team, okay? So, hacker and hustler are the best combination. If you're a hustler, find a hacker. If you're a hacker, find a hustler. Uh, that is very important. Find it, embrace it, and 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 you know uh, enjoy finding your your soulmate. Because in the end, we will spend more time with our co-founders than honestly with our own couples. So, and if not, well, there is a problem because this is a like a you know entrepreneurship and work-life balance. Of course, I could be politically correct and tell you, yeah, you should prioritize your health because it's the best way to be productive. That is true, okay? And if you can do it, go for it. But there will be specific moments in the in the race that that will not just be possible, simply speaking, okay? It's like telling uh, an artist to, to go back home at five o'clock, you know, home. You know, the artist would be obsessed with the idea, with the you know, with with the, the painting or the or the script or, or the, the book or whatever, or the, the sculpture, whatever. So there's no such thing as work-life balance uh, as we commonly see it on a professional field, but it should be a personal life balance. Otherwise, you will be burnt out. And also, you need to calibre or dosify your own energies and, and consider that this is not a... This is not a velocity, you know, a speed race, you know, like a high intensity race. This is a long term race. This is a marathon. So you need to keep your own uh, energies, uh, you know, at the right level. But uh, even so, you would be so focused on your on your on your project that most of your life you will spend it with your co-founder. 
So, and having a one co-founder increases dramatically the chances of uh, success. Even having a three co-founders is the best number of founders in a company to ensure the success of a company. The third part of the triangle sometimes, and now especially with startups, it's called the hipster, okay? And being a hipster is not just being on the street playing music uh, or just, uh, you know, having a bear uh, and, you know, it's not like that. Being a hipster means having a, a, an abstract way of thinking, uh, focus on the, you know, the, the, the perception of your product and your brand, your design, uh, your aesthetics, basically is the product person. Is the is the front person you know Apple would not be Apple if the iPhone was not so beautiful the iMac hadn't been so beautiful the you know iPod had not been so beautiful and that's thanks to well, maybe some thanks to Steve Jobs that he was more he was a mix between a hustler and a hipster and he had his uh, hacker that was Steve Bosniak but uh, Apple actually didn't take off, like, or uh, take off again until the chief designer officer at Apple designed the iMac. It was not Steve Jobs. He was the, he was the designer that actually is the current designer of, of, of Apple, if I'm not mistaken. But he gave the soul. He understood Steve Jobs' vision uh, of a hustler. He uh, took the technology that Steve Wozniak at the beginning and the, the tech team had developed and projected a different view to the customer. And that is the hipster, is the person that takes care of uh, the design and the product and the brand and is not a good salesperson, but is not at the same time a very uh, executive person, is, is an artist. So try, just try to find that triangle and you will increase dramatically your chances of success. And that triangle should be aligned in terms of values, purpose, and, and, and be aligned of expectations. Because you can find with your, with your co-founders, some of them might want to create something quickly for the money and go to the next project and sell. Uh, others want to make a life, uh, lifestyle business, not maybe get initial external investment because if we're growing, organically then let's keep going like that let's keep ownership of our business let's let's retire with that business well that's another choice uh, but if the other co-founder is trying the opposite is trying to grow as much as possible short time possible or take over the world when he or she might want to take over the country those things need to be very well aligned so there should be a lot of alignment and discussion and, compa and, and character compatibility when you check with your co-founders because let me tell you, this might be one of the most important sessions in the whole, you know, uh, program because we're discussing the emotional parts of it. How important it is for us, you know, our emotional motivations and traits, but also our team and our values and our purpose and everything. And those things might seem very ethereal, but at the same time, I'm telling you, they're the key point of, uh, uh, of at least being on, on good chances of, of success. Now, uh, <clears throat> at this point, I think I got 10 minutes in order to finish, nine minutes. So uh, I'm going to check if there is, uh, there is any questions, okay? I'm just gonna check on my Twitter. I think it was uh, Emprende you know, AI Conference, E-A-E -E Conference. So I invite you to ask any questions uh let me just check and if not please let me know uh because there's nine nine minutes okay okay i don't see it now but i'm not sure if i am typing it the right the right way so but just just give it a try eae conference as the hashtag and feel free to ask any questions. So in, in the meantime, I will be summarizing. Basically, for this session, we've seen the expectations of 
and the scope of the whole course, each key uh, elements of the contents of the course. Uh, I've talked a little bit about myself and my background to understand who I am and why I tell you what I, I'm telling you. And then we've uh, got uh, more deeply uh, into the personal, social and emotional aspects of entrepreneurship, uh, putting focus on the elements that we need to find on the ecosystem, the traits that should look into ourselves uh, in terms of uh, traits and skill set, uh, how, how those traits are affected by passion and purpose and how that leads us to uh, starting companies from the why instead of the what that means the you know to apply the golden circle uh, rule and how that will lead us to find uh, other co-founders and we've covered the archetypes of those co-founders the hacker the hustler the hipster if you find uh, and how you can be aligned with those co-founders as a way to ensure the, the stability and, and power of your business and how those uh, co-founders should be aligned in terms of expectations, goals, values and, and of course uh, traits. Uh, I think uh, I finished for today so and I have no questions and I'm sorry if there are and I am not seeing them okay so I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. Uh, in the next session, we will be focusing on uh, lean startup and customer development. We will see how important it is to understand the customer and how to find the right problem. Because today we talk about the purpose behind the problem we're trying to solve, but then we need to find the problem. We've discussed about how important it is not to focus on the idea, but to focus on the problem. Uh, if you've find a good problem, a real problem that could be fixed either because no one has ever found a, a way to solve it or because the ways that are being solved are not as good as, it, as they could be, then you're into something powerful. Then it's all about execution uh, on how to find the right solution uh, to solve that problem because people are willing to pay. If not the, 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 the final customer, maybe advertisers or other people and that's why we cannot know who will be paying because we don't really know the solution yet we know we think we have the solution and for that it's very important to avoid two other mistakes that are very common first one is don't become a Gollum entrepreneur do you know Gollum from uh, Lord of the Rings where he was saying, uh, my precious, you know, uh, he was obsessed with his precious. Well, don't get obsessed with your idea. Don't get obsessed with your uh, business uh, idea because, you know, I've seen so, well, not so many, but a few people that they tell me, hey, I need help with my business, but you need to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, you know, like a confidentiality, uh, in order for me to tell you the idea. Well, that, not just for me, but for any investor, is a turn down. I mean... <laughs> You basically say, okay, just forget about it. You know, I don't sign NDAs. If you know, if a person is so greedy and so nervous about the confi of the the fear that someone might copy the idea, then it's not understanding entrepreneurship. That it's all about the people. It's all about execution. It's not about the idea. I can copy any idea in the market at this point. Anyone. And. You know, uh, what's the point? I mean, first of all, when you tell your idea to people, people have more important things to do than just thinking what a great idea it is, let's make a business out of it. As if making a business was like click on a button, you know? It takes a lot more than that. So, uh, I would not be afraid of people copying your idea. And let me tell you, I've been through that. Someone has, a, has copied my ideas and I don't care, you know, uh, because it's not important. Once again, if you apply the methodologies that we will see in the next classes as, once again, I was telling you, making experiments on a weekly basis, what's the point of building, I mean, copying my idea at, at T0, you know, uh, today, taking a picture of the product today, 
when I will be so many changes and you will not know why I'm making those changes because you don't know what I'm measuring. You don't know how I'm interpreting. You don't have the people in my team that are so passionate and so complementary to me that have that purpose together and that have these methodologies and, and have the, you know, the brilliant and the intelligence and the, you know, the instinct uh, and the analytical mind to make those changes and, and evolve with the market and find that product market fit. You can copy that? No. You can copy just what you see today. And maybe what you see today is just the top of the iceberg. Of the iceberg. So don't be afraid of sharing and exchanging your idea because one of the principles that we will be applying this uh, next classes will be uh, get out of the building. It's one of the main principles of customer development, which means get out of your office, tell your idea to you know as many people, ask, uh, interview as many customers that have that problem. Make sure that the problem is really the problem that you want to solve and understand the problem and the context and the people that have it and then find a solution for it and make sure that people like that solution. As simple and as complicated as that. So uh, that's one thing you need to avoid, being a golem entrepreneur. And the other is uh, don't become a wannapreneur. Wannapreneurs is a wannabe entrepreneur. Uh, there are many people that they have an idea and as a way to somehow escape from reality, you know. They get happy with just the idea of thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. And they tend to polish the ax, you know, try before cutting the tree, but they polish it so much and that they never start cutting. And that's what I call a one entrepreneur. And that's usually a person that goes to each and every entrepreneurship conference, each and every entrepreneurship class, uh, that reads each and every book on entrepreneurship and never, I mean, tells, tells everyone about the idea in this case and I oh, have this great idea. Never, never, never takes the leap of becoming a real entrepreneur. And I've seen so many like that, like hundreds of people like that, let me tell you. So my advice is don't become a one entrepreneur. Either you become an entrepreneur or you don't. Just don't fool yourself. Um, and the best way to do it is, I mean, when you know, one entrepreneurs, they remain as one entrepreneurs because of one single word that is very important for me. I mean, it's like an obsession for me for the importance that you can see in the world. It's called fear. Basically, we're afraid to fail. We're afraid to jump. We're afraid to quit your you know, our jobs, we're afraid to lose our money, our credibility, our prestige, everything. It's all about fear. Uh, and the opposite of fear is love. Love for the people we want to solve the problem for, love for ourselves, love uh, to create something. Uh, love is creation, you know, I'm, not, I'm sorry to sound hippie or sin, you know, but I'm just saying that you know, get closer to the opposite of fear. And by that, and that's one, one of my main motivations uh, in this course, is to lower your fear. First of all, is by recognizing the fear. Second be, a way to, to uh, overcome your fear is understanding what is real about that fear and what is not. And what is real is, I just told you, you know, about failure and how hard it is and everything. But once again, it's part of the game. Uh, but at the same time, uh, lowering your fear is lowering your chances of the bad outcome. And that means helping you with the methodologies, with advice, with expertise, with experience, and, and try to lower the worst case scenario. Because once again, I will want to help you that if you fall, at least you're not afraid of dying, you're just afraid of breaking a leg because you will be falling from a, fifth, a first floor, not from a fifth floor. And if that means to start your company with less than $100 and from your job, without quitting your job at the beginning, the very beginning, then do so. That's called hybrid entrepreneurship. And that, according to Harvard research, uh, increases the chances of success by 30%. Just by doing something on your free time as you keep working on your current work uh, job, get money from it, get finance from there instead of from other investors, 
and in your 20% time you start developing something and by the time you have developed something good enough then it's time to jump so that gap between you know be wanting to become an entrepreneur and actually becoming one if we try to you know lower the the gap and the, and the bridge then we will lower the fear and therefore you will be closer to entrepreneurship and farther from one entrepreneurship so that's it and i see you next time thank you very much